All right, so I am Alicia Largent, um, and my journey with dogs has been pretty much my entire life. Uh, since the second I was born, we've always had some kind of project and adventure going on with dogs. And uh, when I was younger, we lived in Evergreen, Colorado. Um, and at that time, we raised uh, Malamutes and Wolf Hybrids um, before Wolf Hybrids were a big thing. Uh, and then our neighbor at the time had a Rottweiler and my mom fell in love with the Rot. And for pretty much the entire majority of my younger years, we, we raised Rottweilers, specifically German Rottweilers. Um, big, beautiful dogs and I love them and I have a soft spot for them still to this day. You just don't quite see the big Germans like you used to anymore. And then we, of course, had Yorkies because, you know, everybody's got to have the big and the little. Mm -hmm. And uh, Yorkies have an attitude and our Yorkies always, of course, ruled the house. The Rottweilers knew it. Uh, and our Yorkies would even beat up our Rottweilers. It was always interesting to see our little two, three pound dog beating up our 160 pound German Rottweilers. <laughs> You know, little dogs in their Napoleon complex. Right. Uh, then when I graduated high school, I moved out and I moved into the bully world. Um, I raised bullies for about four years. I had Gaudy and Razor Edge lines. Um, at the time, the area I lived in, bullies were of course the stigma and even to this day there's still stigma behind bully breeds um the way people reacted in in the area i live because we're pretty farmer agriculture it, it was hard to do anything with the bullies um so i moved over to australian shepherds which i had also had as kids and i raised aussies for the last 15 years until about three years ago well, two years ago, actually, now, um, I started my adventure with the American Molasses, and it's opened up a world of new things to me, dogs and breeds I had never even heard of, I've found through being a part of the American Molasses world. What drew you to the American Molasses originally? So interestingly enough, my mom was the one who first saw the American Molasses. After our last female German Rottweiler died, Natasha, it was really hard for any of us to think about another giant breed. There's just those dogs that, I mean, they capture every bit of your heart. And you know you're never going to be able to replace them because they're just that amazing. And so my mom and I both kind of drifted away from the bigger dogs and my mom did the Aussies as well um, with me and she saw Euphrates in People magazine while she was standing in line uh, just thumbing through a news or magazine like you do whenever you're checking out waiting and she saw the American Molasses. Um, she started looking in the King Corsos and then she just kept running into the American Molasses and she showed it to me. And I, the first one I saw was Sasquatch, um, and his younger video. And I just loved his look, um, the way he moved. It was beautiful and phenomenal and unique and different. Um, and that is kind of how we got into the American Molasses world. I contacted Marcus. I talked to Marcus on and off a lot while I was on the wait list because um, he has a wait list for years in advance. I got really lucky with my first female American molasses that I got. Um, I was on the wait list. It was going to be like a year and a half before I was going to get a puppy. One came available, and within six months, I had my puppy. Um, her name was Zipora. And so our kennel name is actually Alethea Zipporah Molossus. Unfortunately, Zipporah died at only 16 weeks. Um, so we didn't have her very long. She passed away from a genetic uh, default. She had lesions in her lungs. Um, Jay 
who was the original breeder of her, and he was really, really nice. He worked with me, and he was able to do a breeding and give me his pick female, um, and that is who Safira is now, my main female to my program. And I was pretty blessed to get Safira. She's she's a pretty phenomenal dog, and I love her. And then Safira kind of uh, opened up everything to me, really just loving the breed, her temperament, her demeanor. She's highly intelligent, super willing to please, super willing to work, and um, incredibly functional. Uh, not all of the molasses are functional, um, but she she's just crazy athletic and does stuff all the time. That still amazes me. And she kind of took me on a completely different journey with the American molasses and opened up my eyes to a lot of things. And so I do things a little different than others when it comes to the American molasses. I focus on health and functionality above anything else. Movement. Um, Just everything about her conformationally. She's very well put together and she can move. She can twist, spin, turn on a dime, jump. She can when she wants to, my brother has a huge lifted truck and jumping up into his big lifted truck is nothing for her. Mm-hmm. Um, the molasses has kind of a stigmatism behind it that they can't be functional. They're just these over excessive mastiff neos, neo mastiffs. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are, there are ones that are out there that are functional and Safira is one of those. Um, you know, I take her hiking and she's gone on 14 mile hikes with me before and it was nothing for her she did it perfectly well um she goes hiking all summer with me we do anywhere from six to ten miles usually when we do hikes and she's out there with me keeping up no problem climbing rocks and doing things that a dog should be able to do and moving like a dog should be able to move it has been a complete learning curve. I, I have been in dogs my entire life, and half of the time I feel like I'm an idiot anymore. Like I feel like I don't really know anything. Um, it, it's, it's been different. Um, I, I was in the Aussies for so long. I really knew and understood the health and the genetics behind them. And Aussies, I mean, they're, they're just functional. They're incredibly athletic and do everything. Um, my Aussies are like little mountain goats jumping from rock to rock on edges, scaring me. And coming to the molasses and just kind of realizing there is a difference. Um, even when we had our German Rottweiler, there's a difference. Our, our German Rottweiler, she was a 168-pound German Rottweiler, and she was incredibly athletic, um, running and hiking and keeping up with us as kids, and um, she used to race us on the four-wheelers when we were kids. I mean, she was incredibly athletic, and these guys, I'm learning, there is there is a lot of difference. Um, Safira, my Nate Mel, she she moves really really great, super athletic. Um, and then I have Nessie and I have Ty, and Ty is only months old. And he's kind of like a big goof at this point in time. His feet are bigger than anything. He's tripping on them all the time. So understanding and learning that these guys don't mature and grow like other dogs. It takes them much longer you know they don't even hit their full potential till they're two and they're just kind of awkward goofy teenagers up until that point um and, and just learning how their build fits different than than other dogs i'm used to um and the health behind these guys the health has been a, a big challenge slash um, learning curve because I don't know and understand all the genetics behind these guys like I used to with the Aussies. Again, that was 15 years of learning and I'm two years in. Um, and with the American Molossus being such a new breed, there's not not a lot known. There's not a lot done. Um, not a lot of 
hip and elbow mm-hmm. testing being done, not a lot of heart testing being done, um, or eyes, anything that you would kind of consider that should be done with these giant breeds, it's just not being done. At this point in time, I am the only American Molasses program that I'm aware of. People are changing and adapting every day, so more people could be doing it now. Um, But I have been the only one who does what is the Canine um, Orthopedic Foundation's Chick program, so the Canine Health Index. I go based off of their program and their information. What do we test on the Neos? What do we test on the English Mastiffs, since the American Molossus is both? Um, And I do every testing that they say needs to be done on both breeds for my dogs. Hips, elbows, hearts, eyes, and genetic panels, as well as thyroid. Um, Heart condition seems to be known in the Neos, and it is something that has been known and kind of an issue within the American Molossus as well. So at this time, just really trying to learn how to do it right and do it good so that the breed can continue to grow and move on um, and be a breed that people know and are proud of and can go, wow, that American Molossus, they've got good genes and, you know, they don't seem to have a bunch of health issues and they're living to be like 12, 13 years old. That is, that's kind of my goal with these guys. And um, right now, it's a lot of learning. I've immersed myself back into as much technical training as I can. Um, I used to be a, a vet tech, so I was a vet tech for six years. And I have even put myself back into um, like continued education through veterinarians for understanding genetics and uh, understanding health. And so it's, it's been a massive learning curve. Yeah. I have, I have reached out to multiple people and I have made some pretty amazing friends, um, who are helping me learn every single day. Um, I found some great mentors and that's one thing that I always highly recommend to anybody doing anything, um, with dog breeding, find yourself an amazing mentor it's taken a little bit because uh, there's a little stigmatism behind the American molasses. Uh, not everybody's too fond of them. So it's taken some time, but I've, I've built some great friendships and I have a great um, connection with people who are really trying to help me. I've learned training stuff. I'm a dog trainer and I feel like I kind of know a lot. I've been training dogs for 18 years, but I've even learned a bunch of new training stuff from different people and they've given me books and DVDs and um, my family thinks I'm crazy because anything and everything I do is always dog related. I'm always learning. I'm always uh, doing things. But yeah, I have reached out to some great mentors. Um, There has been some seminars and some clinics done by the English Mastiff Kennel Club and then the Polio Mastiff Kennel Club and I've gone and I've I've listened to their seminars and gotten involved in their stuff to just learn even about each of the breeds so that I can really have a firm trying to have a firm knowledge of everything yes so I'll be honest I really love and I everybody probably who follows me knows this. I love Safira. Safira is an ex- a perfect example of what she should be. Um, now, she doesn't fit the color standard, but at my, my level of where I am with the program, color is not as important to me as health and function. So with Safira, I know Safira's genetics are 100%. Her hips and elbows are perfect. Her heart is great. Her eyes are great. Um, I've not had, like, cherry eye issues or entropion issues with her like some of the other dogs. So she's a great prime specimen. Um, I recently bred her, and I found two really great neo males that I bred her to, and I did keep two puppies back. So at this point in time... um, kind of using her as my main 
specimen and finding some awesome males doing some dual sired litters off of Sephira and keeping puppies back to start introducing the genes. When you get into these large and giant breed dogs, it's really hard to have, you know, a bazillion of them. When I had Aussies, I had 17 Aussies and it didn't seem like 17 Aussies. Um, but I have three giants and you can tell I have three giants. I mean, they take up a lot of room. So uh, it's kind of starting with her and just finding some really, really good males. I have found two awesome males, at uh, English and a Neo, that I'm going to do a dual sired litter on her next time out of. Um, again, just using the best that I can find and working with people who will work with me. Yeah, so with the American Molasses, the English community and the Neo community are honestly not the most fond of the dogs. Um, and not a lot of people are super willing to work with you because it is, it's a hybrid. Um, you're mixing two breeds of dogs and a lot of these phenomenal, amazing dogs out there, they're purebreds and most people want to keep them purebred, which is of course a hundred percent understandable and 100 percent perfect so it's a little bit harder to find dogs to use within your program um because most people don't want to get involved or let their offspring become part of the program and again completely understandable um so that in that regards it, it's a little hard to find the perfect specimens um but you got to just kind of go out there and and talk to people and explain things. I have learned when I'm open, I'm honest, and I tell people why I'm doing what I'm doing, I get a different response out of them. Um, so open and honesty has been key in explaining, you know, I know that there's a stigmatism behind the hybrids. But this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So with the English, of course, your English Mastiffs, when you can find traditional old English Mastiffs, you know, the big, beautiful 200 plus pound English Mastiffs, um, they bring thighs. But also the English Mastiff at 200 pounds, if it's a good bred one, um, well bred one, they they can move. They, they still can do what they need to do at that weight. And a lot of times you could look at a nice 200 pound Mastiff and not honestly tell them pictures that it's this huge monster just because they're so well put together. Now I love the demeanor of the English Mastiff, but I also want something that can protect a little bit more. Um, the English Mastiff doesn't always have quite the guardian trait as like the Neo. So then with your Neo, that's where you kind of hope to get a better guardian trait. Um, now your, your Neos can come off more aggressive and I'm not trying to do aggressive. I'm trying to find an even kilter between a little more teddy bear and aggressive and trying to find an even temperament um mastiffs neos can be pretty stubborn in general but your english mastiffs are really good about kind of i'm done so i'm done mm -hmm. where the neo still has that drive that want to work and and do the thing for its owner and handler so trying to bring both of those traits in of course with the american molasses being so so new still it's a lot of non-consistency to anything at this point in time whether it's temperament looks build demeanor um so trying to find your best specimens within your american molasses with doing your two hybrid crosses and then taking it further from there is kind of the goal and the plan mm -hmm. that is a hard question because if we go by an actual standard, most of the dogs that I love 
don't quite fit like your AKC standard anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, the bigger old traditional lines. I like, I love the rainmaker lines. I love the St. Patrick lines. Um, I love Joe and the fur beetles. Like I, I love all of them. Um, and they're those bigger, older traditional mastiffs. Again, they may not show as well as some of the newer traditional lines. So again, that, becomes just more of a personal opinion on who I think has the greatest mastiffs out there right now. Um, there is a lady in Germany, uh, Cheese Hill Mastiffs. God, I love her dogs. I absolutely adore her mastiffs. They're just, they're beautiful and they're phenomenal. Um, and, and there are some really great kennels out of the United States that have some awesome dogs. I, I like the Assisi dogs. I have an ACC English female, um, but I don't like her temperament. She brings a little too much to the table. Um, so it's, it's kind of that you got to find that right, perfect fit of temperament and confirmation. So she's a little sharper than you would like. Is that what you're saying? She has an incredibly high prey drive, okay. way more prey drive than what you want. Cause if you're taking a Neo who has, play drive and and working drive already and you throw that english who has a crazy intense working prey drive mm -hmm. you kind of get these dogs that are a little more than what you bargain for so the older like the old traditional english mastiffs they were the ones that most people think of when they think of an english mastiff um very large in structure um you know hitting those 200 or more pound markers and over the last 10 15 years um you will see now kind of the the regular mastiff is what they are now and they're sleeker they're thinner you know probably hitting maybe 160 170 in weight they don't quite have the big blocky heads like the old english mastiffs have they're a little thinner through the heads body frame structure even their bone structure is a little a little smaller and thinner i've actually gone the complete opposite direction where your older traditional neos were not as extreme or ex, um, excessive with the wrinkles and the folds um, they were much more functional um, most people who see like a mastiff from the 70s or a neo from the 70s and 80s don't understand that it's the neo of today so the neos of today have much bigger bone um way more folds way more wrinkles and not all of them are as functional as they used to be so the the two of them kind of flip-flopped on what they were and what they now are Again, out of the country, um, I've, I've found some really great Neos um, out of the United States that I really like. A couple different kennels. Um, Chad Mayo has probably two of my favorite Neos in the U.S. They just, they're really well put together. He imported both of them. Um, but I, I run into kind of an issue with the Neos. Um, finding breeders who are doing the health testing and I don't want an extreme excessive Neo. Um, I want a tire, more traditional Neo. Mm -hmm. um, and so you don't see as many of those in the United States. Again, my program's a little different when it comes to the American molasses because I don't want my, my American molasses extreme or excessive um, again I want them to be functional and when you have so much skin um, it causes entropion it causes cherry eye skin infections so the neo aspect has been a little bit harder for me trying to find find neos that I really like who are who are tighter and um, not as typey then you probably have a hard time running into the people who would, would be willing to work with you, right? Yes, and then trying to find somebody who's willing to work with you. Uh, finding beautiful dogs and then finding people who are willing to work with you, 
it it's very very hard i have been on a search for two years to find dogs to breed to um i have a male he's a baby and i don't honestly know if i'll ever breed him to safira i might breed him to her offspring um but finding males that i really want to be able to breed to safira that fit what i'm looking for and what i want and the people who are willing to work with me it, it's hard mm-hmm. and i'm also kind of again a little different i i want my dogs to have genetic testing and you know hips elbows eyes heart like I really want my males to be able to have that as well because I want to be producing as healthy a puppy as as I possibly can do Um, and not everybody again is even doing those standards and the breeders that kind of do hold themselves to those higher standards um who work with the OFA through the chick program. Mm -hmm. Those are kind of those breeders that don't want to dabble or play or even mess with the American molasses. Mm -hmm. Um, And I completely understand. So it's kind of, it's kind of difficult finding everything that you want in a male dog and uh, being able to grow with your program in the direction you want to be able to grow with you always have to show value behind something and in anything and everything you do. And once you're able to get out there and kind of show why you're doing what you're doing and you produce dogs who, you know, can move, who are healthy, who people don't make fun of, um, is good. There's, there's a lot of backlash in the American molasses world, especially if you get on any kind of Facebook group pages, um, even within the hybrid community, most people don't value or respect the American molasses. Um, a lot of people feel that there's no functionality behind the breed. Uh, why would anybody make a more extreme Neo? These are very common questions and statements that you, you get all the time. And even some of the mentors that I have now, it took some work to get them to decide to like me and mm-hmm. talk to me. Mm-hmm. Because even when they're like, you're in the American Molasses, why? Like, why would you do that? Um, of course, talking to them, explaining my vision, my goal, it's changed opinions um, with people. But there's not always the best things said about the American Molasses. So being able to show that value behind the breed is is key um and there is there is more than just myself who's working to do this there are a couple other breeders out there who are trying to kind of follow suit with the exact same idea and even at that we've we've created an american molasses kennel club Mm -hmm. and we did that because we all need to be holding each other to a higher standard and working together if you're out here doing it alone I mean, it's going to take twice as long as having help and having partners and people who share the same goals, visions, and ideas as you. So we are an actual kennel club. Mm -hmm. We are recognized federally through the state of Colorado. Um, we're, We're a nonprofit. We are an actual kennel club. But there are only... Um, a couple breeders who are actually a part of the kennel club. Uh, there has been trial and riff in the American molasses community, and there is a division for sure. There is half that's one way and half that's the other. Mm-hmm. Um, and it sucks that it's that way, but unfortunately that is just what it is. And so Lone Star Mastiff, Southside Kennel, Dark Mountain Molasses, Regal Warrior Molasses, and um, Valkyrie Kennel are, and Alethea and myself, are the only breeders associated with the American Molasses Kennel Club at this time. Mm -hmm. And through the American Molasses Kennel Club, like I was saying, we are holding each other to a higher standard. There's been 
a lot of heart issues, a lot of hip issues in the breed already. So as a kennel club and making sure that we're all making sure we're, we're all accountable, um, we as a kennel club have now made it a requirement. If you are an approved breeder, you have to do genetics, you have to do hips, you have to do eyes, you have to do heart. If you do not follow that protocol, you are not an approved breeder through the American Molasses Kennel Club. Because these are things that should be done. Like, it just has to be done to help better the breed, to help grow. Um, There's been far too many losses of young dogs. Just last year, there were six dogs under the age of three who died. Like, that's not okay at all in any breed. Like, it shouldn't be happening, and and especially in a breed so small. So we're working really hard to try to do things right and make sure we're all being accountable for it. I see things different than I think a lot of people do. Because I've been in the dog world my entire life, um, and we've raised and we've bred and we've always done things right, I've never known any different than to do things right, but there's always those corners. If you cut corners, then, you know, it's not as expensive. I mean, genetic testing, health testing, all of that, it really isn't that expensive, especially for what the cost of these dogs are. Um, You're looking at a couple thousand dollars to get your genetics done, but like with me, we have five dogs in our program, but at this moment, I only have two that I'll breed. The other three don't, don't cut it. And it's not, it's not fun to have spent $5,000 on a dog that you, um, now have is just a pet when you had planned to breed it. And I think that might be some people's hesitation. If you know, you know, and you can't, um, be oblivious you can't deny not knowing, you know, deniable plausible. So I think that's probably the biggest thing I've, I personally, in our program, we have had seven American molasses. One died at 16 weeks, one died at nine weeks, um, both to known defects. We have a male. I love Melchizedek to death. Um, He was way too close of, of line breeding and Melchizedek pretty much has every genetic issue wrong with him than he, that he can. Um, and, um, I have another female Nessie. She unfortunately is a carrier for a heart disease and it seems to be the same condition that multiple American losses have died from. And because of that right there, I just, I, as a, breeder can't do that I can't produce something and know that there's a chance that my puppy before it's a year old could pass away like it would crush me as a person I strive to give dogs life and long life you know in the Aussies I've had little things randomly pop up and it crushed me as a breeder you know two dogs out of 15 years and um some crazy genetic just popped up and they they died at six months old and it crushed me i replaced the dog for the people and i still stay in contact with them they love their new dogs but it's still it's been six years and it still haunts me and i just can't chance that i can't do that so the health concern of the heart condition that seems to be coming up in the american molasses is a heart condition known in the English, it's not very common, um, but it is more known in the Neo. Um, so you, when you're using two breeds that are incredibly similar when it comes to different genetic issues, you kind of chance having that one specific gene pop up more. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, just like in, in any giant breed dog, you're always concerned about hip dysplasia. Um, elbow dysplasia so there are a couple big things the heart hips and elbows that are known between both breeds I I hold even the male dogs that I I breed to at a little bit higher of a standard as well than others um, because I want to make sure that 
my males are tested and again being bred to a good female um even though safira is 100 percent clear and good of everything it doesn't mean that i want to go breed her to an affected dog mm-hmm. because then i have chances of producing affected and carrier puppies mm-hmm. so making sure my males are good making sure my females are good it, it is a it is a challenge um it's not always a challenge like this when you're in other dog breeds because there's you're in that breed and there's an open pool to you um with the american molasses and most people not wanting to be a part of it or be involved in it it does add it adds a lot of a challenge so so i said earlier it's been a very very large learning curve for me And sometimes I'm like, holy cow, this is a lot. Right. (laughs) But I love the dogs and I, I really do love the idea of them. And between all of my dogs, the personality and the traits have been pretty, pretty even kilter on what I'm looking for. Um, I really like that they're a guardian, but also sociable, um, which does bring me to another topic I did want to talk about. The American Molossus, you, because the neoprate is in there, um, socialization is huge. I socialize my dogs a lot so that they are what they are. I can take my dogs in public and I can take them downtown trigger-treating. I actually dress my dogs up in costumes and I make them go downtown and go trigger-treating with me. Mm-hmm. It's match. Um, but I take them Home Depot, Murdoch's, Tractor Supply. Again, I'm in a small little area, farm and ranch. So, uh, my farm and ranch stores, I love them. Um, but getting them out and getting them social. The American Molossus, because of the Neo temperament, just like a Neo, if not properly socialized, um, they can be more territorial they can be more aggressive so this is a breed that does require socialization training and constant training because from the english and the neo you get stubbornness mastiffs are known for being stubborn um you know you're always laughing at the pictures that you see of people on their walks with their mastiffs who have just laid down and (laughs) aren't moving Um, guys can definitely be the same way so that training that socialization I really think that's what's helped my dogs be what they are and I love that my dogs know that during the day because I'm a canine trainer I have people and dogs in and out all day long Um, they know that people are going to be coming in all day long but the second I close my gate and I shut up shop they're on alert it's it's time to work it's time to guard it's time to protect and i love that quality about them that they are able to be great with dogs and people all day long and protect me and my family at night um i will say and anybody who wants an american molasses training is key socialization is key Mm -hmm. you have to be Um, like a strong leader with these dogs. Uh, The American Molossus is not a first-time dog dog. Like, Mm -hmm. first-time owners should not have an American Molossus. I would rank them kind of in terms of what kind of owner handler they need to have. It needs to be a more experienced owner. Um, somebody who is not intimidated by the dogs. These guys are great family dogs as long as they have a good leader, Mm -hmm. somebody who is going to set boundaries and expectations right away. These guys are huge. Some of them are like 100 pounds already by five months old. So I'm talking the second that they get in your house, you have to set these boundaries and expectations and start working with them. With me and my my litter of puppies I just had, we started everything right away. We started crate training, potty training, the second they turned six weeks old, so that they started understanding that there's boundaries. Um, I did socialization with them. I followed the the puppy culture 
stuff as well as other people's opinions and I've kind of mixed it and made my own. Um, we did the pat evaluation, we did confirmation evaluation on all of these guys and ranked them so that I knew what kind of puppies I had and what kind of homes these puppies could go into. Um, because they are, they can be stubborn and they're huge. And if they want to push you around, they can push you around. Um, I'm little, I'm like five foot tall, 120 pounds. I'm not very big, but my dogs know that they're not going to get away with anything because I set those boundaries in right away before they got bigger than me. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that is one thing you have to do with the American Molasses. You have to be a, a, a firm owner. And that doesn't mean crazy where you're prong collaring and shot collaring and getting too out of control with it. It's just firm. Mm -hmm. Clear boundaries, clear expectations, and having well-trained puppy right away. Whether that's you doing the training yourself, watching some videos, or taking them to a trainer. And I always, as a trainer, behaviorist, and um, everything, I always tell people puppy classes and classes are key to a dog no matter what. It teaches them to listen and respect you with the distractions. So getting your puppy out there and getting them socialized with other dogs and puppy classes and group classes and um, getting them to understand they still need to listen within those distractions. So at this point in time, the breed standard is still the same as what Marcus um, wrote up in, I think, 2015, Mm -hmm. with the exception of blue is an accepted color within the Kennel Club. There are quite a few blues, and within a breed that is so young, I feel like being able to use good dogs should not disqualify them because of their color. Um, If they're blue and they're phenomenal, they should be able to be used. And I'm not just saying that because I have two blue ones. It just so happens that both of my blue ones are phenomenal. And sometimes I wish they were brindle because I love the brindle. I love the black brindle and the reverse brindle. And I love the brindle. Um, But my brindles haven't worked out in my program. My two that are good and solid at this point in time are my blues So as a kennel club, we don't fault people for not having acceptable colors because at this point in time, we are open to healthy, functional dogs and breeding healthy, functional dogs. Mm -hmm. So based off of the standard, um, again, if we're showing confirmation, then the dogs need to be perfectly within the height and weight standard um if you're a breeder and you have a good dog why call it out of the program if it doesn't 100 percent fit fit that standard um so with the american molasses breed standard that wrote marcus wrote in 2015 The dogs are supposed to be 31 to 35 inches for the males and 27 to 32 for the females. Um, I know that some of these males being used in the American Molasses world at this point in time, not even just the kennel club, just in general, aren't hitting that 31 to 35 inches. They're not that tall. Um, Most Neos are not even that that tall. Um, And so, so... It's not as much about the height and the weight Mm -hmm. and making sure these dogs are hitting that height and weight for us. Again, like I said, it's it's the health, it's the function. Mm -hmm. And I probably sound like a broke record when it comes to that, but that seriously has to be the base to anything before before you can really just start saying you gotta be this or you're out. Because there's not enough dogs, number one, to use in the program. Um, Not enough people who are willing to allow you to use their dogs within the program for you to have to hit all of these markers right now. Yes, it's great to follow a breed standard and go with that standard. But when 
it's achievable. Um, if you're calling dogs out of the program because they don't hit your height or your weight, but they hit every solid health condition or like, you know, they're healthy. They hit everything that they're supposed to. They're clear of genetics, heart, tips, elbow. And you call them out just because they don't hit the height. But you use a dog who has bad hips because they do. That's not okay. Um, so as a, as a kennel club, our main focus at this point in time is really just health and function over everything as well as temperament. Um, making sure we have dogs with good temperaments who you're not concerned are going to be too aggressive that they attack someone or somebody in your family. Mm -hmm. Um, we're, we're, we're too new to really set too much of a standard and expectations at this point in time. And I mean, standards are great. They're there for a reason, but you've got to have health and functionality behind a breed before before standardizing every dog. Um, if your standard is producing dogs that are not healthy, um, there's something wrong with the standard and you should probably go back to square one and start over. So for us, it's really okay. We know what the American Molossus is supposed to be. Now, how do we get there? Mm -hmm. But with health and function, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the American Molossus was, is this recreation of an ancient breed. So then you also have to think about, okay, let's think back to ancient times. What kind of dog would really be able to live back then? Like an extreme excessive dog who wasn't functional, who couldn't move, who wasn't healthy, would not have survived at that time. So also keeping that in mind, okay, how do you try to bring back the best representation of this? And I have been learning and even studying into like Central Asians and Caucasians and some of these older dogs that are really, really, truly known to come back from the original molasses. And watching them and watching the history behind them to truly kind of figure out and learn how do you keep up the best representation of what a dog of ancient would have been. Mm -hmm. Out of the ashes we will rise. revenge of those we On the rough and keep on fighting.